thinking about that all day. I was like, oh, maybe I should get a ring light. Maybe I should. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to count three, two, one, and then I'll take a snapshot. Okay. Okay. Three, two, one. Don't you know that you're back? Fairmont's lovers, welcome to another episode of That's a Fact. I'm your host, Kirsty Adams, and I am blessed to be sitting beside Marsha Joshua and Sheba Matsatsa, who are such experts in the business and legalities of music and arts entertainment world. Welcome to Marsha Joshua and Sheba Matsatsa. Please give them a wave and a hello. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining the show i am such fans of your work and i'm sure everyone else is that knows of you and whoever does not know you should definitely get to know you um because it is worthwhile and it is such an honor to have you on the show and uh, to have your expertise on the show as your question master on the show and as that's a fact usually runs i'm going to be asking questions around your expertise and how it pertains to the world of arts, especially considering women in the arts, because that is our business. So um, without further ado, my very first question is just simply, how are you doing? I am good, I'm blessed. I am grateful to see the new year. Um, as you know, the times we find ourselves in, it's uncertain. So I feel good, I am good. It's a difficult one to, um to try to answer generally because I think you know we're all used to very much used to a roller coaster of emotions every day every hour you know mm. um today I'm feeling quite refreshed I've been very busy lately which I'm grateful for I think it's a privilege to have something to do during a time where you know everything is so uncertain so um I think it's mostly gratitude that I'm feeling these days so thank you for having me here as well grateful for that too Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm just glad that everyone is safe and healthy as much as they can and just functioning, just doing with the most or what they can with um, the time of isolation. So give us a full rundown of what you do, where you come from, why you do it. Um, give us a full rundown about yourself. Uh, you know, it's funny, th this question, it goes along with the sort of pronunciation Shiva, Melissa, Mazaza, I always had these three names together because they speak directly to the kind of person that I am, what I do, and my identity. And, you know, my parents are from Malawi. I was born in the UK, but I live in Cape Town. Um, and there's this sort of jumbling of cultures and belief systems. And I think that's very sort of evident in my name. But also there's a jumbling of experiences, cultures, um, and influences in the things that I do. So. I started out as an art student, I think this was what, 2012? Um, when I left uh, uh, UCT, um, Michaela's School of Fine Arts. And I thought for the longest time, because I was always good at art at school and everyone was telling me that that's what I should pursue, that that's what I should be doing. And it took me actually going to UCT and trying to get a degree in fine arts to realize that I didn't want to be an artist, but I wanted to be around artists. I wanted to enable artists. and. I wanted to be able to describe the things that artists were trying to do and to feel and to contribute to the world. And so shortly after that, I became a voiceover artist. Um, I think at the time, people weren't uh, familiar with voiceover artists. I mean, you know, you hear voices on TV and radio adverts and you think, oh, well, how do they how do they do that? Um, I was actually a waitress at the time and I was still trying to figure my life out. Wow, this question, we're gonna be here forever if I go really in depth with it. So I'm gonna try and skip through some of these things. But, um, uh, you know, I was a waitress and I, I had a customer who overheard me taking down some orders and said, you know, we're looking for a voice for Elle magazine. We've got a year long, you know, campaign that we wanna do. Would you come in and do a read? And I thought, I don't, <laughs> it's better than serving people coffee every day, I guess. I mean, I enjoyed my job, but you know, this I didn't know anything about and Elle magazine was a thing back then, you know. So I said yes and, I've been doing that ever since. It's been a bit over a decade and, you know, I've voiced hundreds of campaigns. It's been really fun. Turns out I'm quite good at it. <laughs> um, but after that, um, I realized that music has been, you know, a golden thread throughout my entire life. My parents had a huge record collection. 
I was always singing along to the radio, trying to learn lyrics, things like that. And so after my exposure to this kind of job as a voiceover artist, I became more curious about singers and songwriters and whether or not it was the same thing. Um, so the skills that I was, I was learning, I was wondering if people who were making music were also sort of privy to those kinds of skills. And so I was doing a bit of research um, and I would sort of make notes about the music that I was listening to. And I sent that into a magazine called One Small Seed. One day I had a, a blog when the internet came along and they said, please, can you come and do some music reviews for us? And since then I've been, you know, working for various platforms as a journalist, OK Africa, True Africa, Afropunk, Mixmag, Resident Advisor, Red Bull Music, oh, you know, uh, the list goes on. And as I was growing as someone who's experiencing music, you know, front to back, um, more and more artists would approach me and ask for help, tips. You know, how do we do this? What do we do if we want to get a bit more publicity, if you want an event? And oftentimes I didn't know the answer. So I'd say, okay, I, I'm not really sure, but I know how to find out. So I became a door lady, a stage manager. Um, you know, the magazine started having events and we'd run those. And so every sort of opportunity I got to learn something about the music industry, I would take that. And that's brought me to today where I've been managing artists directly or indirectly through other companies for about two and a half years now. And um, yeah, it's just a jumble of all of these things that that form the sort of structure that is me right now. So um, yeah, it's not going to be as long, I think. I've... <laughs> <laughs> My life's not exciting at all. <laughs> um, so I'm Cape Town, born and raised. Uh, grew up on the Cape Flats, uh, matriculated in 1993. And then I went straight to study law at the University of the Western Cape. Um, I had another first choice, um, but then I was led to go join my twin sister um, at UWC. She studied psychology and I studied law. Um, and I went straight into the corporate world after that. I did articles for two years, wrote my board exams, um, and then I uh, started working. I was admitted as an attorney in 2000. Uh, working corporate probably for 15 years. I took a bit of a sabbatical uh, when my children were younger. I went back into the workforce and then um, I changed my area of specialization in 2018 uh, to focus on entertainment work. I am a wife, a mom of two teenagers. I run a household. In the middle of all of this, I have to balance my work, my myself, my teenagers and everything. So that's me in a nutshell. That's epic. And I'm not a mother myself but I look up to mothers so much because to do that on top of your profession is just very inspiring. What type of artists do you manage, do you work with? Hey, I'm a legal consultant, I act as legal counsel. Um, so I mostly work with producers, uh, individual artists, directors, um, and different creatives in the industry. I, I just wanted to also say that I wish I had met you before, Marsha, because I definitely need you. Um, at the <laughs> moment, I'm working with mostly, I don't want to say mostly, I'm, I'm working with African artists, black artists. Um, this is, I started my own company last year in January. It's been about a year now, but before that, I was working with lots of different kinds of artists, different genres. Um, but I realized that a lot of the work that I'm trying to do is necessary for artists who don't necessarily have um, access to things like, you know, educational tools, studios, you know, usually growing up in townships. And these are the kinds of artists who are trailblazers, really. I mean, in things like mm -hmm. Amapiano, Tom, Jazz, um, there's not a lot of assistance for artists in general, uh, whether that is financial, um, psychological, emotional, um, and so that's where I put my focus. So um, at the moment, uh, my first, my very first artist who is doing particularly well, his name is Amos right now. Um, he is a gem. You don't get very, very many artists like him. Um, he came up as a, a neo soul sort of singer, um, but he was swept up by the Emma piano scene. He's done very well in the last year. I'm very proud of him. Um, he has managed to get a, a song that he wrote in the top 20 songs streamed in South Africa for 2020. He's got a Netflix deal. You know, all of these things have just been because he's 
he's so focused and so hungry. Um, and uh, I've come on, you know, board to try and help him steer the ship and to make sure that he's protected and and that he can grow in the best way that he possibly can. I'm sure that this kind of career is very eventful. And my next question leads me to ask, what was your most favorite project to work on in your career? Actually, um, my favorite project was, this happened last year, just before COVID became a thing that we were concerned about here in South Africa. Um, I have a couple of friends up in Norway um, and they, I had met them through a, a late friend of mine down here. He passed away from COVID last year. Um, but the four of us had put together an event that we wanted to have um, to create an exchange from South Africa to Norway. And so we you know, got in touch with a bunch of artists that we were aware of down here. It was called Mela Goes Off Um And this was happening during a festival in Norway called Bila. And that happens every year where you have, um, you know, professionals from all over the world come through for a conference and a bunch of showcases that happen over a week. So an Oflam event is sort of like a satellite event for this conference. So um, what they do is they invite delegates from around the world. And so we were the South African delegation and we had our event at a place called Melahusa, which is Mela House in Oslo Central. So we took uh, KO, uh, rapper, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with, probably should be. He's very influential in our South African sort of history in terms of music. Uh, style, all sorts of things, um, and his own label as well, Skanda Republic. Um, and then we also took Da Kruk, who is one of the first guys to have played on a piano on commercial radio. Very, very talented, very driven. He's also a businessman. Um, and so the, the point of this uh, festival and conference is to have people share their expertise in sort of conferences, workshops, um, but also to be able to network and grow their sort of business ideas and find new acts. So it's, it's all about emerging acts. It's not just about um, people who have already made themselves um, in their sort of specific scenes and are now looking to sort of connect with more um, established artists. This is for people who are starting out and need to reach, you know, the, the movers and shakers in the industry quite quickly. Um, so it's a quick uh, KO and um, a bunch of other people from uh, Ghana, King George, uh, Kata DC, who's a DJ from Uganda. Um, we had Suhail, who was from India, producer. So it was just like like the place, the name Mela means sort of a melange, a mix. We had a bunch of different people come through and we had some showcases, uh, some panel discussions. We met up with some Norwegian artists and there were some collaborations. We got into studio. It was a lot of fun. But this is the first time that I'd went to um, Norway on my own. Um, I had gone before for another different conference where I had been asked to speak. And this was just a couple of months before the trip. So the second time I'd gone, I knew the lay of the land. I'd become very um, sort of versed in how to get around. So the second time around was much better, but it was very exciting because this is completely fresh ground for us. You know, we, um, we got to sort of set the tone for what we wanted to do. We built everything from scratch. It was very, it was snowing as well. So it was a very, different atmosphere to what we were used to in South Africa. Um, and we all were as, you know, as experienced as we were in our different sort of scenes, we were all sort of starting from scratch and, and thinking, well, nobody knows us here. So we really need to be on our A game and express and represent South Africa in the best way that we knew how. And I thought that was extremely fun. I learned a lot um, and I would do it again in a heartbeat. It was wonderful. Sounds incredible. Wow. And I'm sure you represented with pride and with excellence there. I hope that was the experience at least and um yeah was it strange to be in, in the conference there or was it more more of an excitement it i don't know how to explain it i as someone who i suppose tries to be very um specific with the words that i choose i still haven't figured out what the word <laughs> is that i would use to describe this experience as soon as i stepped off the plane that was at home mm, you know um there isn't, I, I think that in South Africa, we tend to follow in the footsteps of sort of American artists and practices where, you know, we look towards the West and we think, well, maybe, you know, our hip hop or rap artists need to be able to emulate their styles to be able to top charts, et cetera, et cetera. But we, you know, this, this festival, this conference, these events that we put together, 
um, like I said, were focusing on emerging actors and breaking into new territories. So there was an even playing field. Um, and so it, it's, you're not fighting against the expectations of other people around you because no one knows each other. You haven't really seen a, a track record. Mm -hmm. So you put your best foot forward and people take you at face value and everyone is open. People want to hear what you have to say. They're keen to listen to the music. You know, it's not as if um, because someone is not uh, performing in English or in, you know, Norwegian or whatever other languages that they would be say saying, okay, well, we're not really interested in that right now. Everyone is open to hearing what everybody has to offer. Um, and so that that really is quite freeing. Um, it's it's. I think when people see a track to success that they think is tried and trusted because so many people around you in the industry are doing the exact same thing, you forget that when you're in a completely new place, um, that you you don't necessarily have to fight any sort of preconceived notions. You're you're there as you are, and people are very accepting of what you have to offer, and it's it's a very sort of giving space. So not strange at all. That is absolutely true and i i really would vouch for anyone to follow that advice of going in your own lane and whatever you pick up along the way on the outskirts um is something for influence but not for the main stage if you if you understand what i'm saying um so like i mentioned earlier my change of uh, i changed specializations in 2018 in 2019, I was fortunate enough to work on an international production, um, which forced me in a way to hit the ground running because it was still fairly new to me, um, which was good in the sense that I could um, learn on the ground. Um, I was right there with everyone. I could ask the questions I needed to. It's very really exciting to see where um, South Africa is going and where Cape Town is going specifically. I think um, it's a great space to watch. I think there's a lot of interest because I feel like you can be in Cape Town, but you can you can choose this to be anywhere else in the world. Um, Cape Town is so beautiful. And I'm only going to speak from a Cape Town perspective because this is where I am and this is where I work. So um, I think it's exciting to see where things are going to go. So. Um, being part of that production was great. I could be on set. I could see how everything's done. Whereas uh, if you compare it to just a normal corporate job um, in the legal field, you're sitting behind a desk. You don't really see people. You just lead contact every day or you're just advising um, on a call or um, via email. Whereas this for me was awesome because I could see how things work, how things are put together, um, what it takes things to be put together, um, how long it takes with blood, sweat and tears um, just to get something on screen. Um, so for me that opened my eyes a lot and it really, um, I think it set things up nicely for me because now with the next project, it, you know, it gets better, you know what to expect, you know, um, uh, you know how things are put together so you can approach it in that way. Um, I'm very excited to see um, more things coming out of South Africa, coming out of Cape Town. Um, and I think it's a great place to be in. It's so fine to have Cape Town bias because we are pretty, we are pretty and our place is pretty. Um, you also mentioned the fact that you um, worked on the Blood and Water um, Netflix show. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Can a little bit. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> so, so like I said, it was my first a show working on an international show um it was good in the sense from a uh, just from an academic point of view to um learn other territories laws look at contacts from other territories um i'm not at liberty to speak too much about it but um just understanding um the way different lawyers from different countries do things differently so it was nice to be um to sit with that and look at that from a and see it from a different perspective i think in general um you know we have to when you work on an international show you have to look at the country that you're operating in but you also have to look at the country where um, that you're contacting with so that's important mm -hmm. to keep in mind um all the time as this kind of career and this kind of business runs you get all sorts of kinds of incidents and on that note i'd like to ask if there were any difficult incidents 
um, if there were any difficult incidents with an artist that you've experienced, um, tell us only if you would like to. I'm going to I'm going to speak generally. Um, I find uh, just as a, um, a a lawyer in the industry, I find when people are entering uh, contracts, uh, people tend to want to overprotect themselves, which is good, but it's also not good. Um, in the sense that uh, the very basis of, of entering into a contract is good faith. So there must be some sort of trust. And, and if you can't trust who you're contacting with, if you feel that you need to completely, completely protect yourself, scratch out every clause in the agreement, then I think you need to take a step back and say, okay, you know, do I really want to work with this person? Um, there must be good faith. Um, between the parties and I know people are not really trusting um, in this day and age um, you all, I think it's, it's the online influence part or um, people are just afraid to relinquish their rights um, I think it's very important to, to understand uh, what you are, are doing what type of contact you're entering into what your rights are so I won't say a particular um, artist was difficult or a person was difficult, but I feel uh, I'm in the contracting phase, I feel people want to overprotect themselves. Um, and it does cause delays, it's, uh, there's a lack of understanding, perhaps. Um, and I think it's good to have somebody to um, speak to that can explain it to them before they enter into an agreement. It's a tricky situation because yeah. of you're handling someone's life here basically i mean if there isn't um if it's not being in the medical field it's being a lawyer yeah and that trust factor is just very important mm -hmm. um and i can imagine how difficult it is to foster that and to convince but at the same time if you're born to do it you're meant to do it there's always going to be a difficult a difficulty somewhere i think that if you have a career that doesn't have any kind of difficulty um something's missing something's still coming then because um you know there there are a lot of let me be frank there there's there's a shortage of really decent and i'll speak from a from an artist management point of view the reason why i'm doing this for, for this artist particularly is because there's a shortage of really good managers who understand the business who know you know what's going on i mean some of the best right now uh, i was working with black major uh, in 2018 and uh, Sevi Spanudi manages Black Major. She owns the, the company and she's one of the best. Uh, I learned everything I know from her. Um, and she is busy, so busy. And some of the things that I experienced while working with her, you know, it's, I think that um, what people don't understand about management is what it means to be managed and what a manager actually is supposed to do and not do for you. Um, and what the expectation is. I think that a lot of artists will say, okay, I think I need a manager. Maybe they're gonna make certain things happen for me. Everything is gonna be fine once I get a manager. That's not, it, that's, it's a little bit backwards. I think that the difficulty comes when people assume that they need things that they're probably not ready for. So um, if you don't have an actual career to manage, your manager can't really help you. Um, there, you know, there needs to be some kind of movement. An artist needs to be proactive before they can see their career go in any kind of direction. So, um, you know, another thing, like Marsha was just saying, I completely agree, you know, there's a lot of trust that goes into it, you know, handing over your career to another person to say, please help me, you know, to, to steer the ship. Um, you always have to have your paperwork in place when you enter into an management agree uh, agreement because, <clears throat> Essentially, um, <laughs> this is, it's, it's someone's life and you need to understand exactly what you're agreeing to for how long, you know, who's doing what, what is, what is the remuneration, where is the money coming from, who's going to be signing things, the works. So, um, yeah, I think in short, you need to, to really sort of as an artist and as a manager understand that have something to manage. There needs to be something happening in order to make it go further but also around that partnership there needs to be a solid agreement about what is happening and what happens if things don't go according to what the expectations are you need to understand what the expectations are and trust that the person that you are interacting with 
can actually carry out the duties that need to be carried out and not what you expect or think a manager or an artist is supposed to do. There needs to be an understanding and there needs to be trust and then there needs to be paperwork. So I think those are some common problems, difficulties that I've experienced where, you know, even, even you know, when I was not experienced, I didn't understand fully before what I needed to know and what I needed to do in order to be able to perform my duties. But the, the number one thing is that everybody needs to be productive, learn as much as you can as you go and never stop learning. If someone approaches you and says, I know everything about the music business, don't worry, I'm the best, red flag. Because things change so quickly in this industry. I mean, in the last few years, you've seen how social media has changed the way that we communicate, you know, um, even with, you know, legal, I'm sure there are a few things that have changed you know, in the last few years, yes, that mm. people just don't know about. And if you don't actively go and pursue that knowledge, you're not going to be able to execute. Fire the manager. That is the, that's the slogan here. <laughs> um, you mentioned something about technology and which leads us to the next question about social media and technology. Do you think it makes things easier for artists or harder for artists? And I think we, when we say something like this, we're especially talking about the current times things easier well it depends on what things i think um if we're considering the, the current time right now and we're talking about technology and social media uh, it, this is something that's always been important and i think that people now trying to sort of shift and say okay content is king or whatever the saying is these days it's always been true um whether we're in a in a lockdown or a pandemic or whether things are normal you always need to keep an eye on that but um, I think that social media and technology are tools. These are things that help you get things done more efficiently, more effectively. Um, so yes, you know, if you want to reach a lot of people in a short amount of time, you know, and you want to reach specific people, great, definitely easier. If you want to maintain your sanity and you want to maintain your sense of, I suppose, creativity and lower your stress levels, don't think social media is going to help you with that. Um, you know, you, you will probably be interacting with some people who understand the effects of social media image building, you know, content creation, but if you don't master your own understanding of the way that the world and the way that it moves affects you and affects your decision making, social media is not going to help you to, to sort of train yourself to, to be, you know, um, firm-minded I suppose you know I think that we as human beings can be very malleable at times and we don't always notice when we're being influenced and um, we talk so much about becoming influencers and having influence but social media will make you feel some type of way sometimes and you won't even know that it's happening so as an artist you need to keep your eye on that as well take your social media breaks step away from the technology every time every now and again you know schedule it if you have to um, and use it as a tool it's, it's something that will help you get things done but don't rely on it for your self-worth for, you know, those Instagram numbers are not going to tell you what's in your bank account. It, it, they're just numbers. <laughs> I think we put such emphasis on social media these days um, because we feel like it's, it's the way that we can get around um, and get noticed. But at the same time, it's stealing your, your precious time to actually hone your craft, you know? So to a certain extent, it's necessary to understand it um, but it's not the core of what you do. And I think people need to get back to that. Um, Marsha, what do you have to say about social media and whether it makes things easier or d more difficult for artists? Um, my answer is going to be yes and no. Um, I think uh, in this generation, as we find ourselves in, everything is online. Um, you know, you have the world basically in the palm of your hand and you can reach billions of people within hours. Uh, something can go vital, but it could be good or bad. So what I think people need to remember is that it is a, yes, it is a tool, but it's all, it can be a weapon as well. So, um, you know, the minute somebody gets a little bit of attention, there's somebody that's going to go hunt back years and see what you've done on social media. Did you make a sensitive statement? Um, you know, was the hate speech? So people need to realize that whatever you put on social media is there forever. Um, so you need to post with integrity all of the time. I mean, I think it's a good exercise to go back to your high school years and look at what you posted on Facebook or 
uh, commented on a picture or so so my answer is yes and no because uh, from a legal point of view i think yes it's great you, your reach is amazing uh, you can reach the whole world within 24 hours even this but also uh, my no is that um, it can be uh, detrimental to your career and to to the kind of reach that you want so i think mm-hmm. people need to realize that social media is there to help but it can be dangerous as well and there are um, there are consequences for negative or illegal behavior online it's interesting you say that because nowadays there are functions where you can delete um, content and go back and delete but there's always that ethical hacker or unethical hacker i think it's white hackers or black hackers whichever one i think they're both capable of doing the same thing basically mm-hmm. but getting that information i think we can understand this from you know a political point of view where you're dealing with presidential information especially so mm-hmm. yeah I, i guess it's yes and no is definitely a good answer <laughs> I am dying to ask this question and I think Sheba and I spoke about this and have you ever experienced an artist management moment where you made the move and you made it and it was risky or yeah you made the move the move was risky and the risk was successful <laughs> You know yeah I was thinking about this and um it's 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 bringing me back to the moment from that Norway trip I just started working with Platoon at the beginning of last year um and they had you know implemented a bunch of label services uh including sort of campaigning and so i was managing campaigns for a few artists for the first quarter and so during the snow age trip i thought you know there's this young man called king nintendo and he's just got this amazing style very original vendor rapper and you don't get a lot of vendor rappers actually um And so we were looking for some acts to bring over to Norway and I'd never met him. <laughs> I I don't know if I would repeat this, but uh my instincts were telling me there's something special about this young man. Um I've listened to his music and I've read some of his stuff, we've had a couple of conversations and he'd been recommended to me by um some fellow writers uh I think it was a year or so before. And I thought, you know what? Let's bring him. Let's book him. Let's see if he can perform. I've never been to one of his shows. Nothing. So there was a huge gamble. I didn't know what I was in for. But I spoke to the guys at Platoon and I said, you know, this is one of your guys, what do you think? And they were like, okay, we trust you. Let's let's see what happens. And so we went on this trip. Um, I arrived a couple of days early because we were working on production and sort of building, setting the scene and everything. Um, and he arrived, we were supposed to be on the same flight, but he arrived a day later. And this was the first time that I'd met him. I didn't know what he was going to be like. So sometimes you want to get a feel for someone and then figure out what their temperament is, what their habits are. Um, and uh, my instincts were pretty spot on. You know, he was staying at the same hotel as the rest of us and we would all go downstairs for breakfast and he he's obsessed with drinking tea. So he was always carrying some tea around with him, doesn't drink alcohol, very even tempered, philosophical, philosophical guy, um, you know, ready to perform every time, very hands on. He was just such a dream to work with and the music was just so good. And um, I think that he, he managed to get a lot done in that week where He made a lot of friends very quickly. He made great impressions so fast that we, we could take him on a media run around Norway to some radio stations. You know, he knew what to say at just the right time. I didn't have to train him, um, which is something that I've had to do before. You know, some artists don't have media training and so they don't know how to, you know, you shove a mic in their face and they just sort of freeze. Um, and, you know, like Marsha was saying, on social media, you say the wrong thing, it's over. It's there forever. But none of that was a concern. Um, so that was a gamble. But we got the content, we had our performances, we made a lot of great connections and we left Norway with some great footage and a nice bump in his streams and I was very happy and to this day, I would do it again, definitely. That's so great and you obviously still managing this artist right now, right? He, well, you know, um, I probably should have mentioned this earlier when you asked what kind of artist I work with and it's usually How do I say this? They're they're sort of on the cusp of of becoming something that is very that sort of sells itself. You know that um, the analogy where you know where you have your cash cow and your dog and your you know rising star. He's he he he's graduated away from me. I like to work with artists who who need just that push to be able to get things really going. Once you're you know in a in a direction where you have a good team and and you can carry that, and it's just a matter of spinning off of the things that have been happening. 
I don't think those artists really need me anymore. But when someone has a great talent and they've got everything in place except for that, that one missing thing, maybe it's a brand shift or some introductions to some powerful people who can do something with them. Those are the artists that I like. And, and King Batendo is one of those. And I think that he, you know, he's found what he wants to do and he no longer really needs me to sort of guide him anymore. And I think that trip was a big part of that realization. So yeah, success.